This is HighIntensityBusiness.com with Lawrence Neal, helping you become a great personal trainer and grow your high-intensity training business. Lawrence Neal here and welcome back to HighIntensityBusiness.com. My guest today is Gary Knight. Gary is a high-intensity trainer and online high-intensity training coach. He's worked with thousands of people from different backgrounds and acquired expertise working with high-powered execs and CEOs. In his latest venture, Gary is helping high-intensity trainers like you guys uh, grow their online hit coaching business. Gary, welcome to the show. Hey, Lawrence. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks. Good. Good to have you back on the show. Um, so excited to talk to you about this because I think I've had interest from listeners and members alike uh, in starting some kind of online high intensity training coaching business. You know, maybe they have nothing in play, no business at all, and they're interested in becoming a coach online because they see it's got potentially good earning potential and it's a nice business to run. You can kind of run it from anywhere as long as you've got a laptop and an internet connection. Um, Or maybe, and I've had examples of this too, where people already have a hit studio, but they want to generate more revenue or scale their business a bit more and do that by starting an online hit coaching business as well. So there's a few different examples here of where people might be interested in implementing this. Um, and also for myself, you know, I used to do this myself a bit. So I had a, at one point I had about four or five clients who I worked with online to help them achieve their goals with hit and nutrition and coaching. Um, so it's something that I've moved away from since I'm now very focused on helping the, the, the high intensity business owner and the personal trainer. But uh, it's something I have some experience in, which I'm going to, which will help me to bring some of my questions to the table. Um, so the way I wanted to kind of start this one off is, is you, you kindly sent me an email with, um, some points you wanted to go through in terms of how you might structure and build out a program. So do you want to just kick off and start going through that and then we'll just go from there? Yeah, of course. So the first thing you sort of need to understand about online high intensity training is the fact that, you know, there's a lot of efficacy in training someone one-to-one. There's no better experience than going to train with a a good hit coach in the live environment who can teach you and correct your form live and in action. So when you start to direct your business model away from the one-to-one face-to-face setup, you need to kind of start thinking about, you know, well, what is your program? You know, how do you deploy high-intensity training um, to a person who you only see through a Skype chat, you know, once a week? Um, So the first thing you sort of want to realize is that you know, that person's going to need some resources that they can refer back to um, that can kind of ground them in, you know, what high intensity training is, how to, you know, achieve the correct sort of form and cadence on the exercises. And then you need to kind of include all of the other processes that are involved in terms of your transformation journey. So what I would sort of say is like, you can never just have like, I think a pure, HIT online coaching business, you you have to kind of aim at a certain client and you have to be solving a problem. And HIT is just your solution to that problem in terms of, you know, building muscle mass. But you also have to factor in nutrition. So, you know, just doing HIT three times a week and reporting the numbers to your hit coach isn't going to turn, you know, a fat person into a, a lean, mean, muscled machine. So, How you want to achieve that is by, you know, setting up that support document in such a way that you can really sort of precisely, but but not in an overwhelming way, um, communicate that information about what you need a person to do or the steps they need to take um, in order to to fulfill that goal they have, which, you know, is typically everyone jazzes it up a different way, but health is just you know, not being fat and being pretty much as muscled as, as you can pull off naturally. You know, like we, we word it in all sorts of ways. We specialize in all sorts of different avatars. But um, for the most part, the, the, the most common problem you'll solve is, is take some fat off the midsection and muscle someone up. 
And you might get the opposite situation where someone's like a hard gainer and you need to muscle them up and feed them up, which is just kind of reversing the diet a little bit in terms of encouraging them to eat. But essentially that, um, that support document, program guide, welcome pack, whatever you want to call it, it's just, um, it's a piece of information that just articulates the entire process. Um, with, with sufficient sort of resolution that the person can, um, refer back to it and, and achieve what you need them to achieve to get results. Um, so it's a pretty, it's a pretty critical document. And I I think making it is everything in terms of just organizing your own thoughts and your own process. Um, but in terms of the client who, you know, in some cases might not know anything about high intensity training. Um, you know, they hear it from you for the first time or they might watch a few videos about it that sort of brought them to you. But um, getting them to be able to pull it off in real life is much more complicated. So if you don't have some sort of support literature to help kind of answer some questions ahead of time and explain things ahead of time, you're going to have to waste a lot of time going back and forth in emails, back and forth in extra communication and I think if you can solve all of those things up front in a nice logical way with some written material or video material, um, it'll be a much smoother process. You'll get better results, better retention and a good story at the end of it. Yeah. And like, you know, that's a really good point. You talk about um, almost having like systems in place where you, at the beginning, you might not have anything, right? Although we will, well, we might, might as well use this, this opportunity to talk about the resources you provided, Gary, which is uh, Gary's very, very generous and offering a uh, example template of a program and then also a tracker on a Google sheet. Um, and so we'll be giving that away on the blog post. Uh, so you can go to the blog post for that, which will be over at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash online hit. Um, but at the start, you might not know what type of questions you're going to get. Uh, and so what generally happens is you'll build up this system over time. But the cool thing is, is that once you get that question and you, you create an FAQ or you create a video to demo, then when you get the question again, all you have to do is send them the link. So all you have to do is make sure that you have these resources nicely organized in a Google Doc or on, you could even put it on a YouTube channel and you could even make it unlisted if you wanted to keep it private for just your clients. But Sorry to interrupt you, Gary, but that, I just think that's a, it's good to be able to build that system up over time. And obviously, they can use your resources as a template to help do that as well. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. So with these kind of documents, especially with, you know, all the cloud sort of technology we have with, with the Google, Google environment, is that they're a living document. So they evolve over time. Every time you have a new challenge, you can optimize things. You know, you, you might find that certain elements of, of, of your document um, don't do a great job of explaining things and you get these questions where you're like, well, either they didn't read it or the way you're speaking to people or to that particular person isn't um, explaining things adequately. But keep in mind, you know, it, it should be a relatively simple, efficient document and it's almost like it should articulate enough that they can achieve it, but it is still kind of like a prompt. At the end of the day, like you're going to need to do deep coaching with people. You're going to have to refresh them about how to perform things. So that's when you kind of want to think about, you know, this document is to get every person, you know, onboarded into the process, get a good idea of the strategy and the overview. And then your job as the coach is to kind of, you know, work out over time, you know, where is the document where you can fix it. But a lot of the times it'll just be the client needs to be explained, you know, to a little bit better. You can only pick up so much from, you know, reading a document or even watching a video. Sometimes you need to to chat to someone, you know, figure out where they're at and then kind of meet them there and then and draw them into the world a little bit better. But um, definitely it's a living document. You can give them um you know, the, the live link. And what's really cool about Google is as you make those changes and those new additions, they just click on the link in their email and they've got the updated information. Yeah, that's awesome. So you've given a kind of overview of what the, the importance of having some kind of program, some kind of document that you can continue to revise and can then serve as your reference for all of your clients, which I think is critical for um, definitely making your business more efficient and saving you time. Um, and adding value, obviously, to your client, helping them get results. So, I mean, we can talk about marketing separately, how to get your clients in the first place. Um, maybe we'll talk about that on this one, maybe on another one. But um, 
let's say you have a you get your client, so you, you have someone sign up for your service. What's the process? Talk me through how you so I guess you've got that document, that's your like onboarding thing. Um, but then mm-hmm. what happens thereafter? Like what are all the different things you might do and, and to ensure they get results? Uh, I mean, the first thing is you, you need to, once you get them to sign up on the video call, um, you need to basically at that point, you know, send through payment information. You know, this is what it will cost. You know, I, I recommend probably pushing for an upfront payment kind of model where you, you get like a three-month program or a six-month program covered up front, but you might have a month-to-month payment or something like that that's a little bit price here over the long run, but they can kind of dabble at it month at a time, which which might help with buying and things like that. But so you're yeah, giving once price you make, breaks for for bulk purchases basically. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So yeah. in your sales call you, you need to move on that. And the second they've said yes, you need to be sending them something to act on and, and try and get them to act on it right there and then. And once the money's through you you should be onboarding them as quick as possible, setting them up with all the documents and literature, um, having your first you know, real coaching call to start everything off. So, you know, get that money in, organize and book that first coaching call. Um, And sometimes you want to book the next coaching call. So we're going to start with your first coaching call on this date. Let's lock it in. I'll send you the payment information, send it through straight away, follow them up to make sure that happens. Once that happens, you are ready for that initial coaching call. And that's where you want to go through this document with them live, if you like, and and go through, say, the Google Tracker, which I'll share with everyone. But it's basically, you know, the 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 HUD or the the hub for where we're going to store all the little data points that we're going to be tracking. And so you want to go over that with them. And we can do all this stuff with the technology we have at our disposal. So you can you can use um, a few different free programs to um, share screens and stuff like that when you're chatting on the internet. Um, and, and go through it together and, and break down the steps that you need them to follow and then they can ask questions. Um, take all the initial measurements like body weight, tape measurements, um, things like that. Show them their log sheet and their training program. Tell them to print it out. Um, get them to kind of, you know, repeat back to you, you know, what should a rep look like and things like that to make sure that they've really understood um, your approach to training. And just try and set them up so that they're they're ready to go um, and start training as quick as possible, and always be booking the the next call for a week later. You know what I mean? And 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 if you can, like, treat it like um, don't treat it casually. Like they can organize any time in the next week to talk to you. Be like, let's have a regular appointment, just like you would have with the PT. You know, um, so they're going to be you know Monday at you know, 8 a.m. in the morning on a Saturday, uh, Monday, 8 a.m., that might be their time that you have a Skype chat with them because they live somewhere else in the world. And you say, that's a perennial time going forward. You're expected to have completed three sessions by the time you get there. You're expected to have updated your MyFitnessPal and your calorie tracking sections and tape measures, weight scale, all the data points mm-hmm. need to be up to date by the time we go into that call so that we can focus on troubleshooting and that I can see where you're at so that I can optimize things. Um, if you don't do all those tasks for me, you're basically saying to me you don't want it. So you have to be very, very clear about the expectations in, in that initial call and that initial onboarding, you know, get them get them committed, um, you know, because one of the dangers is when you sell something to someone, there's kind of like that glamour period where they've like bought into you and they're all excited and things like that and they just think because they've purchased this product, and it's all going to happen for them. But you have to be very upfront, very frank about the fact that, you know, you need them to be productive. Like your job is to coach them to be more productive at looking after their health and eating better. Um, so it requires work from them. It requires honesty from them. Um, and you need to set that up as quickly as possible, that expectation. So just a couple of things. So for the, for the coaching call, you would advocate doing that weekly? Once a week? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Monthly is too infrequent. Well, I just think, um, I mean, it depends, you know, like I've, I've had clients, right, where when I first started online PT, I literally had actually a, a mutual friend of ours. We, we won't say a name, but um, you guys used to work together. I think you, you'll you remember. And we found out weirdly that we're somehow connected. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. But he, he he had like a like a forty minute chat with me about how to um 
measure food and track food. And I basically set up a little Facebook group, a private group where people in the group could see each other, where I said, post up your MyFitnessPal and your scale readout every night for me. And I think he still does it to this day. And he lost a bucket load of weight. I'm he looks no great. longer kind of, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not. I'm not actively um, coaching him or anything like that. He's he's just kept following it like a routine, like a mantra, and it keeps him in great shape. And he looks awesome. But like that's that's what I'd call an exception. You know, that was probably someone who reached out when they wanted to change, and I just gave them the formula, and they paid attention to a very simple plan that worked, and they just stuck it. You know, just with proper commitment and willpower, they stuck it and got great results and kept those results going forward. But I think with the average client, um, you need to massage the process. You need to be like, hey, buddy. And, and you kind of, you know, they, they have to know you're thinking about them and you have to be thinking about them. It's a one-month interval is like not much of a relationship, you know what I mean? Like it's like that's okay if it's like a, you know, a friend from high school or, or a casual acquaintance. But if someone's a client, you know, you're charging good money, to give great advice, to be on top of their results and, and driving that accountability, then I think you should you should massage that process once a week, you know. You know maybe just once a fortnight if you, if you want to push it down a little bit. But I, I'd rather charge more and intervene more um, than try and kind of get away from the customer as much as possible because I think well, there's a real danger <laughs> in that. Yeah, let's talk about uh, pricing for a second. Um, how do people figure out what to charge for this type of service? I guess, I guess it's always good to think in terms of, um, you know, what do you charge if you're a one-to-one -one PT and you're good at what you do, because that's kind of that's kind of your competition in some way. But then you have to also kind of consider that you know, high-ticket coaching exists and works as a business model but it only works for certain individuals who can really communicate at a high level they've got their marketing sorted out so that they have access to exactly the right person that they're really honing down on in terms of solving that avatar's pain points in that niche um but i guess you know, you, I think you got to kind of work backwards. Like, what do you want your online business to do? How much do you want it to make? So, like, do you want it to be, you know, the source of all your income and pay all your bills? Or is it just like a, a supporting business? Are you going to run it as like a hybrid model with clients that you only see once a week, et cetera, et cetera? But to be honest, like, you know, when I was in London, I would charge, I think I was charging. I think it was kind of like three hundred pound for three months or something like that. So hundred pound a month, but you'd have to pay three hundred up front. So that's about six hundred dollars Australian, you know. But that was like my first ever attempt at it. That was my introductory rate, and most of those clients were when I switched gyms. So I decided to move to a more affluent gym, and I flipped four or five clients straight into the online model. So I basically had to keep a price that was slightly was competitive with what I was already charging them. So, you know, obviously if they're seeing me twice a week or three times a week, that's, you know, 100, 150 pounds a week. So I can't really charge that for, for my on, online. But going forward, you know, I think you need to think in terms of, you know, in say US dollars, you know, you would like maybe, you know, one to two grand for a three month package. Like you want to kind of be a bit ambitious about it and you want to get all your services and all your efforts up to that price point. So, you know, when you asked me the question before, once a month, well, once a month would make sense at, you know, a hundred bucks, uh, at like maybe 200 or 300 bucks mm -hmm. a month PT. But if you want to charge more, you have to get in their life a little bit more, be really on top of them. Like you're there to really massage the process and that can justify the higher price. Yeah. A couple of thoughts I had on this is um, there's a, excellent ebook which you told me about and i read probably 75 percent of it and uh, it's excellent called uh, prosperous personal trainer or something like that from Tim yeah Drummond. that's why uh, um yep Drummond. yeah I, I will link if i try and find that and it, it might not be free you might have to opt in for it or pay for it i can't remember but it's very worthwhile um yeah and uh yeah i found that to be 
really interesting, actually, because it, it totally makes you think about coaching in a very different way. Um, mm-hmm. You know, one of the things which I was going to comment on about pricing is, <laughs> you know, I didn't really even think about it like this, but one of the benefits of charging a high price is the accountability that that then puts on the client. So mm. by, it's almost like, because there's, um, you know, Tim Ferriss talks about this, you know, once you, if you make a bet on something or put stakes in place in, in line with your goals, you're much more likely to achieve them. So by spending yep. more money, even though the service might be, un, you know, there might be a service that charges you $100 a month versus a mm-hmm. service that charges you 1000 and it could be identical. But if you pay a 1000 you're going to be far more yeah. motivated to make the change, um, which is, exactly. I guess, it's difficult for a lot of people to understand that, but that is the yep. truth and how badly do you want to get results right exactly and that's one of the weird things about the psychology of pricing is that you know i think i think it's important sometimes you know to signal what something's worth to you as the potential client you know so a, a good example is you know if you're if you're into say synthesizers like i am i'm into you know electronic keyboards or synthesizers i buy you know i buy 3,000 US dollar synthesizers at a time. You know, I buy the, it's not quite the Bugatti, but it's, you know, it's the Lambo of of this world because I'm signaling to myself and to the world that I'm a synth guy. And and the same is true of coaching. Like if someone will pay premium prices, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 bucks for a three-month transformation, they're saying to themselves and to you that this is it. I'm going to make this effing change. I'm going to go through this process for once in my life, not eat like an asshole for three months and get in great shape. And I think everything about your business model should be hinged on that idea that, you know, you want people to make big commitments. You want to work with people that can make big commitments and and honor those commitments. Whereas someone's just, you know, looking for, you know, the best online hit coach in the world for free or for 50 bucks a month. Well, you know, like it's... You know, you can't serve a person at such a low rate of pay. Like you, you, you can't, you can't actually do it. It can't actually keep you afloat for a start. You start when, resenting when paid, the, the the work. Yeah, itself. exactly. Yeah. Um. So when when you're paid properly for your services, you match that price point. You know, you work up to that price point, and they work up to that price point. So it it, it works for both people involved in it, and that's why you know I I, I did say like I want to talk to that person once a week because I'm going to look at all of these numbers, these numbers are going to become personal to me. So I have to charge a rate that reflects how personal your results are to me. You're not just a number. You're not just following a a cheeky blueprint that you buy $97 once off and I forget about you. You're paying for me to intervene and I'm going to intervene all the time until I change you, you know, and that's what a big price point and what high ticket is ultimately about. It's about you being accountable as the coach, just saying, you know, listen, I am prepared to put a cheeky price out there because I'm going to make this work. I'm going to, I'm going to be your force function. You know what I mean? That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to be the force function in changing this person's life. And at the end of the day, like it's worth zero. It's a complete waste of an investment if you do not get the result. It is zero. You know what I mean? If they pay, if if they you, pay nothing, they pay hardly yep. anything for it, then they're going to be much, much less motivated to actually act. Yep. No, absolutely. Lose, no. lose, so it? it is a lose-lose situation. You can't build a business like that because um, you can't stay passionate. You can't rally behind it. Now, you mentioned earlier about a Facebook group and sort of having a community, which I think is a really cool idea. And something I do in my own business is I have a community so that my clients and members can talk to each other and help one another, um, which is just a very leveraged way of providing a service like this. So do you advocate a Facebook group or building some kind of community um, when doing this? Yeah, I mean, Facebook's really... Yeah, Facebook's really awesome and it was the first way I did online training because basically, you know, my 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 model was nothing more than you reported your calories and your, you know, scale readout as a daily task. Every day you had to step on the scale and you had to report what you were eating. Every day, every day you had to do it. That's what you had to do. Beat your target every single day 
and we adjust based on the results. Um, and it's a good way to get people into a habit, you know what I mean? It's just like a habit of, of, of a, a daily step you take to practice accountability, make sure you're moving in the right direction. And then, you know, once a week, um, actually, I think I was doing once a month calls at that time. So once a month, we'd have a, a, a chat on Skype and we'd go over your log sheet and just look how your training numbers were going. And that was really all it was in a nutshell. But but the difference between like that technically is very, very simple. You know, it's super simple, but um, it's it's how you approach it. It's it's how much attention you pay to that person. It's going through all of those posts and going, good job, keep it up, like, happy face, good man. You know, those are those are the little bits of detail that are important. So letting that person know that you're watching, you're paying attention and you're happy that they've, you know, made that little incremental um, step towards their goals. So Facebook's really, really cool. But I mean, it just depends how you're going to acquire leads and whether that person is on Facebook or wants to be on Facebook in that way. Um, and remember, if, if you say you say the wrong thing on Facebook or something like that, you can you can have your account shut down and then all of a sudden you can lose that ability to see all of those things. So Although it was a very fast, uh, high efficacy way for me to get going with it, because it was just it was so simple, so fast to set up. Um, the reason I'm moving forward with a Google Sheet is because I control it. You know, at the end of the day, yeah. it's my platform; it can't be destroyed. Exactly. Um, yeah, cetera, I'm, I'm a bit. I mean, the the listeners or regular listeners and members will know that I'm. Uh, I can be a bit anti social media at times, and um, I do think in this context that. A building a community on Facebook is a high risk decision. Like it can be effective, but to your point, um, who knows whether they're going to block your group or delete it? Um, who knows if they're going to change the algorithm uh, and just how you know effective the group will work for you going forward? And who knows whether Facebook will even be around in five or ten years? So if you're looking for managing your risk effectively then you may be better off designing your own forum um and that's something i can help with so i'd probably put some links on the post uh, or a means for you to contact me um if you're interested in building your own because that's exactly what i did i use software called zen Foro, um and i integrated that with my blog and i had someone do that for me i i, you know, I hired a freelancer who i still continue to work with who helps kind of maintain it for me and manage it and he's great uh his name's dave and and um you know i can i can definitely make that introduction if that's of interest because i i've created my own forum uh, called the hit business membership where you it's completely private and i'm not reliant on any third parties um i guess i am well that's not entirely true like i am reliant on obviously zen for continuing to license it and support it but it's got yeah. i have much more control over it than i do if i had it on social media um and it also means that i can curate it and moderate it effectively and one of the things i don't like about things like facebook is the enormous amount of distraction on there so you go on there to check your the group right to like check in with your friends and support each other and help each other achieve your goals but then there's a cat video in the corner or there's you know your friends talking about something and then suddenly you've spent four hours on facebook and you know i i, I hate that so I, i'm all about efficiency and efficacy and i think designing your own and i'm even thinking for you gary uh for your business this might be something you might want to think about in the future yeah, yeah no absolutely it, it is just being able to control the, the destiny of your platform is a really important sort of security feature. And I think you just you just want people to be able to access it without worrying so much of whether they have an account here or an account there. Yeah. So that that again is is why a Google Sheet is pretty cool because it's it's so easy to access the Google platform. Um, very shareable and flexible. You can change permissions pretty easily. Um, very, very handy. And, and I prefer that from like even, you know, these sort of data logging apps you can get like Trainerize where you can build programs and all sorts of stuff like that because I'm just like, well, what if their server goes down one day or what if there's a bug in their system? You know, I sometimes think that like a bit more of a back-to-basics approach where, you know, you're scratching things out on a clay tablet with a stick is somewhat more <laughs> anti-fragile than too much technology, you know. So even with things like training logs like, I have it in a Google Sheet and I want them to update and fill it out prior to the coaching calls, but I want them to print it out and take a pen and paper to the gym because I don't want them to, you know, get their iPad or phone out. I don't want them to get trod on or broken. 
I don't want the power to go out on the device. So just, you know, a pen and paper log sheet is the best way to record workouts. It's worked since time in memoriam. Keep it that way. You'll have a much happier time with less stress. So I've, I've run client programs off Google Sheets on an iPad mini before, and I've had all sorts of syncing issues because of what the internet would do at the gym and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, like, it was much simpler to just take out their pieces of paper and, you know, put it on top of the, the writing pad and go for it. You know? I would be worried about, like, I mean, I, 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 I'm pen and paper at the moment when I'm in the gym. Um, and um, I, I would be concerned about using uh, something like an iPad. Even when I have my phone out when I'm working out, I'm like, because I'm so focused on the exercise, I'm thinking, shit, what about if someone just comes up behind me and just nicks my phone, you know? And my phone's like, you know, seven, eight hundred quid, whatever it is, that's a you know, thousand dollar phone. I mean, phones are expensive these days. Uh, and that would be, and that, that means that I can't focus as much on the exercise. So I'm, I'm kind of digressing, but I think, yeah, pen and paper is probably just as effective and perhaps less stressful when you're in the gym sometimes. <clears throat> I mean, the the buzzword for all of those things is discrete design. So a log sheet does what it does. It's just a log sheet. When you go into the world of software and computers, you know, there's all these different sort of levels of complexity that that go behind making that infrastructure work. And um, with that complexity comes risk. So just keep things pretty simple. And and it's very true with with the design of your program as well. Like it needs to be like really simple so that people can achieve it. It's... um, you should just do the minimum, you know, effective steps you need to take to make the process work. You don't need to put sort of thousands of different um, bits of metrics and activity in there because you're just going to overwhelm and swamp people. So, yeah, no, I agree, I agree with what you're saying. Um, keep things really simple. Uh, I love that. I'm always a big fan of you know, elegant and simple businesses. And Google Docs and Google Sheets are just excellent ways to... Um, manage and and, and 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 certainly grow this this type of business um so move, moving on from there um yeah and again actually one other thing i wanted to mention is regarding the community in the forum or facebook group or whatever i guess that is optional and it's something that you don't have to worry about in the very beginning at the beginning it could literally be skype google doc google sheet done like that's those are all the things you need maybe email as well but i think we all pretty much have email so that's probably not an issue um so going back to, I guess, uh, managing the process. So you've got the client, you, are, you have that introductory phone call, you quote them on the call perhaps, and then you try and get that commitment quickly. You, you, you charge a price that's fair, but that is going to get a good commitment from them and make it worthwhile for you. And we've talked about that already. Um, and then you kind of, I guess, from what you're saying there, you follow a once a week sort of Skype coaching agreement. Um, what's happening in between those calls, like how many, you know, what's happening in terms of the training and diet? Like what are the basic things that you would have them follow through their program? Yeah. So basically, you know, you're, you're kind of explaining to them at the start with HIT that, you know, health is about maximizing strength and muscle mass. And, you know, the, the obvious reasons are, I think regular strength training decreases like all types of um, morbidity by, I think it was like 48% or something crazy like that. So regular strength training essentially is a really great way to mitigate, you know, dying early and build capacity. So you're kind of explaining to them that, you know, your job here is really to just get stronger. And then if they're overweight, their their job is to reduce calories um, in such a way that they, you um, you know, chew up more energy than they consume and and their body fat goes backwards so that they're kind of inside or outside of the danger zones in terms of uh, body fat levels. So you figured out those two things pretty early on in your pitch that they need to get musclier and lose some body fat. So then you need to kind of unpack, well, what does that mean in terms of, you know, habits and and what data points do we need to track? So you need to kind of think about the fact that, okay, well, you need them to eat less. So you need to see what they're eating. You know, you need you need to tell them, you know, what they need to do in terms of eating, how to record it, where to record it, and and how you're going to kind of uh, adjust that process as you go forward. So when it comes to diet, like you know, there's there's all sorts of great diets that work. You know, I, I like the carnivore diets. I like some of the low carb approaches. But at the end of the day, like I've I've made eating McDonald's work because 
calories for some reason are always king. Um, and then there's kind of other factors like food quality and stuff like that, that, that go into sort of long-term health. So just getting them to follow a process of maintaining a deficit over the long term to get results is, is you need to kind of make it daily. Um, so I kind of break, break and chunk everything down into daily, weekly and monthly tasks. And so a daily task, because it's really, really critical to fat loss, is to know what you're eating. So I tell them to track everything on my fitness pal. Um, and in order to track things easily on my fitness pal, you need to kind of explain to them how do you design a meal in such a way that it's very easy to capture. So it's like simple ingredients, don't have dishes like paella where everything's like mixed up into a gumbo, make sure they're kind of, you know, chicken breast here or cut a steak here and, and some salad there and, um, you know, some vegetables here. So everything should be sort of in separate, simple meals so that you can measure things up quickly and weigh them quickly, add it into my fitness pal. And then that records what you've eaten for the day and it does all the macros for you automatically. So they don't even have to really think about that stuff. But you just kind of explain roughly that you, you, you know, you're eating, you're eating simple lean meats, maybe with a bit of fat on there, you know, lots of green veggies and, and just depending on where you're at, go easy with the carbohydrates. But again, as long as the calories are roughly good and the protein's high, there's no big drama, but they have to do it daily. So you have to see what they're doing daily. You give them a, a rough target to, to stay under. So the average person will probably lose weight once you start dipping below 2000 calories a day. So it's a good place to start. Um, and so that's a daily task. Record everything, weigh your food, put it into my fitness pal. I encourage you in a minute fasting because I just want you to make one meal and record the one meal once. So if you eat six times a day, you have to enter it six times a day. It gets ridiculous. So you should structure your day in such a way that it makes the process easy. And then they put chuck it into my fitness pal. So that's all they're doing daily is those kind of things. And then they're going to train three times a week. And I consider that a daily task. So, you know, on the day they train, they're going to have to record that workout on their log sheet. And if they want that day or afterwards, they can update it into the Google sheet so that you, the coach, can see it. But alternatively, they can fill that up prior to the coaching call. So that's, so that's just, daily task. Let's just touch on that for a second. So people are listening going, Three times a week, high intensity training, that's far too frequent. Um, yeah. Now, we talked about this in a membership recently, which is that uh, the one of the downsides of online coaching is that you're not going to be there physically with the person. Um, and so, or you're unlikely to be unless you kind of do some kind of hybrid approach. Um, and, and so you can't always guarantee that they're really going to train with a high degree of effort and train to failure, um, which is obviously what we ideally want in high intensity training. Um, and And... So there's that. So this is quite nuanced because there's that factor and that might promote higher frequency to make sure that they're, they're potentially making up for the lack of intensity with greater volume and frequency. Um, but then the other thing as well is skill, the skill acquisition. So if someone's a newbie, they might want to train, train more frequently in the beginning as well. Um, and then obviously you can reduce over time. So is that, so I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on that. Is that why you advocate three times a week or have I got that? Am I missing something there? Um, I mean, I just think no one without your supervision is, is going to go so hard that they can justify once or twice a week at the beginning. You know, they're just, they're not, they're just not going to have the skill level. And even having said that, like you, you want people to kind of take massive action. So, you know, if they're undergoing this journey, they've paid good money you want them to make a big step forward and you want to set it up as, as regular habits, regular intervals, regular reminders. So when you're training, I think three times a week, you know, there's a certain, there's a certain idea that you kind of like, I'm about this life. You know, this is my new lifestyle. I'm a trainer. I go to the gym. Um, and then when you're like a seasoned HIT pro, three or four times a week in the gym is going to annihilate you because your skill level is so high, your strength level is so high that you're, you're tapping all of those fast twitch muscle fibers and they just need a spell. They need longer spells. Um, it's that simple. So the, the average person who's going to be your client is just probably not going to be there. And if they are there, as in someone who's from the HIT world already been doing it for years and they just want your coaching to maybe restart, you know, their journey into HIT and want that little bit of extra care and accountability. Or they might be experienced with HIT but be fat, you know, and they're they're coming to see you to coach them through a fat loss process. 
you can you can adjust and say you know you can do your twice a week or your once a week full body you know do your big five because because I know you've done it before you have that muscle memory no drama but the average person's not going to be able to pull it off and I think skill acquisition was a really really good thing you inserted in there because you know you, you got to practice your craft a little bit you know what I mean so um, it helps helps them get up to speed if they're more regular. I think it helps with the buy-in to the process if they train a bit more regularly than than maybe what we would advocate as purists. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you just pay attention to the results after that. So I've had clients where we've started on three times a week and then I've pushed them down to two because we've said, listen, you need more recovery time, your results are stalled, trust me, this will work, you know, and we go down to two and boom, they start recovering further. They start getting numbers again. Um, so you just kind of, you know, start with something that's reasonable, you know, that's going to get them to buy in, that's going to get them tracking numbers, making a regular habit of it. And then look at the numbers and go from there. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's nothing that critical at the start of this journey. That's that the difference between one, two, three, and probably even four sessions. I probably wouldn't even matter if it was four sessions, as long as you didn't do like full body for three, four times a week. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's no drama. So I'll I'll usually put someone like if they're a guy, I'll put them on a three way split, push, pull legs. That's perfect. Cool. And it's only five, it's five sets, five working sets in a, in a, routine for me yeah. so it's not much yeah, not much at all uh just quick quick uh, reference uh you know gary mentioned a big five and for those that don't know that's uh you can see learn more about the big five in body by science by dr doug mcguff that's, that's, he's definitely not the inventor of the big five but uh, that's certainly what made it popular um and it's just it's just five exercises that pretty much address every single uh major muscle group in the body um do you I'm just curious, you know, one of the challenges I had doing this is um, if you start reducing someone's frequency and they're not a strong responder to training and then all they see around them in the gym is people training with high volumes and high frequencies who look jacked because we all forget or we all know or should know that the gym is basically a selection bias of strong responders who are going to get good results regardless of what they do. And you don't see the graveyard of people who failed doing exactly what they're doing. Um, But the problem is, is trying to convince that person, and I've had this issue, uh, to reduce their frequency or reduce their volume, even though they're surrounded by the opposite. How have you encountered that? And how would you do what I just said there and explain to them about the selection bias that they see and explain that to them, uh, which I actually did via uh, via a, a, the forum. We had a private coaching thread in a forum, um, which was quite challenging. I, I'm not even sure if they fully understood it. Um, but how would you how would you address that type of situation? So, to be honest, most of the people I've trained within my own business have never really experienced much in the way of like stalled progress you know if if they have sort of a plateau or a bit of backwards movement it, it's usually explained away through you know illness or something like that it's it's never really been a prolonged problem so it's sort of it's it's sort of hard to say it's usually that that comes at the start of exercise they're just kind of oh you know I'm used to training 6 days a week will this work blah 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 but I think that's the art of coaching like you you have to believe in what you do so much you know that you can answer all those objections and you need to have a clear articulate response for each one of those questions you need to understand what they're asking what their fears and doubts and emotions are around and behind those questions and you need to tap into those things and, and just, you know, keep explaining to them that, listen, if you want to increase strength and muscle mass, we need to have perfect form, do it with a controlled cadence so that we can measure things and we need to establish trends. And once we can see trends that, that build up over a month or two months, if we have problems with the rate of progression, then we need to kind of experiment within and around our theory to to get that moving forward again but but like i said i mean the the typical client i've had whether it's online or in person is just most of the time those coaching calls are celebratory they're like oh i'm up in strength i got a little bit stronger on this but but every now and then i've like i've I've got one client who's a good friend of mine that's a bit of a hard gainer and you know sometimes his progress will stall for a bit and that'll be where listen we're going to go back to two you know as much as i know you love being in the gym we're going to cut back to two and usually, like, if you've done a good job of setting it up, making sure that they've got good form, um, which I get people to film what they do. So, like, once I, I actually think once 
one time per workout or at least once a month, they should just set their camera up somewhere and just film a set just so they can show you. And that should be part of like their, their weekly or monthly tasks as well, just so you can check because sometimes clients will send a video to me and they'll be like, oh, look how many knee raises I got. And then they're doing something that's like nothing like what I've explained, <laughs> nothing like what I've taught them. And I've realized that nothing has landed, nothing I've explained to them, even when they've watched the videos of me doing it, nothing has landed. So all of the metrics for that month, and that's why I don't like, you know, once a month coaching calls, because that's a big stretch of time to have them, for of them to misunderstood and misapplied. They could totally what, fall off in that time as well, couldn't Oh, it's, mm. it's very, very easy, especially if you're not pulling clients from, from the high-intensity training pool. They're, they're regular people. So it's, um, yeah, it's really, really critical. So Just on the, on the video, um, this is a really interesting point, and um, I might play devil's advocate here for a minute. Um, you know, I had a, a client, the same one I mentioned earlier, um, who definitely made some progress in the beginning, well, at least in terms of the numbers. So I could see that in terms of our shared Google Sheet. I could see his resistance and his time on the load improving. Um, but then he hit a plateau and, you know, without really getting some objective kind of evidence of his form or intensity, I was already paring down his workouts. I was already reducing his volume and frequency. Yep. Um, and he was actually getting demotivated because because he was seeing well i'm now doing even less and everyone's doing more and i was trying to explain that you know uh he may need to do less in order to actually produce results for his particular genotype um but i you know i made those assumptions without ever seeing him work out so i never actually saw him train and uh i i was going to ask you you know how important is it to get a video because retrospectively looking you know looking at this particular client, like if I had seen him train on video, I would have been able to see, you know, how hard he's actually training and then make adjustments based on that. So do you think that, it, I mean, from my perspective, it looks like it's pretty critical to get, to get the video footage really. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it, it's in my daily task list. Like if you train, record one working set and send to coach, oh, right. you know, it's the, yeah, like it's explicitly there for that reason, because I've just, that they're, like obviously a lot of the first clients you get, especially when you're in the high intensity training niche, a lot of people have already come from the world. Like they're already kind of a little bit familiar with what you do or they're a client you've already trained one to one and, and they're, they're going to switch to online. So they're kind of, they know what to do and you can kind of trust that you don't need so much overwatch. But with a new person that you're like, I mean, you're not just, you know, teaching them how to train, you're teaching them how to train in a really kind of fixed specific dogmatic kind of way which is what HIT is you know it's very very scientific and controlled um, and then you know you have to make sure you have systems in place to kind of keep that accountability otherwise like, like you said you can make assumptions and you can you know see the map but not know the territory I guess yeah you just um, feel, you just feel like you're just winging it or just stabbing in the dark because you don't really know so that was a Wish I'd knew that then. <laughs> yeah, no, um, absolutely. Yeah. What about um, tracking? You know, you've talked about getting on the scales, but would you, um, would you have clients do DEXs and BOD pods to get more accurate data? Oh, I mean, if, if, if they're available in their area and they, they want to front the cost, like, yeah, definitely just be like, you can even look up in their city, you know, if you've got them in a busy city somewhere, you can just go, look, there's a DEXA pod here for this price. I'll wrap it up in the package for you. And then you might even want to contact yeah. that place and say, can I get a, a you know, a three scan deal or a four scan deal for one of my clients and get a discounted rate, you know, and then roll it into the package, um, you know, to get, get more accurate results. But this is the thing, right? Like, you know, pe people have lost weight and gained muscle all through history, <laughs> you know, without any of these toys. And like I'm, I'm becoming, I'm becoming more and more kind of reductionist in my thinking about this. Like if, if you teach a person how to, how to do this, this kind of training properly, and you teach them how to measure their food and track the calories properly, then the metrics that you take measurement of, and in the time periods or the resolution at which you take those measurements, is going to work. It's, it's going to show meaningful results. The only reason you would need high resolutions of measurement like calipers and bod pods is because you're you're measuring so often that you need to spot infinitesimal progress 
or you know you're just using it as kind of like a, a cynical pitch to be like we've got all the great tools yeah. and technology yeah. so, sign up for it but like that's part you know, of the appeal. It's, it's, it's getting the it's getting oh, it such ac- well. Yeah. I say accurate. You know, within three percent, I think is Dexter and BodPod. Um, you know, you're getting within kind of three percent accuracy of fat-free mass and fat mass, which is like if you're at well, if you're a nerd like you know we are or I am, then yeah. you you want that data. But um, I don't know how, how much the average person might want that. <laughs> Maybe they don't. Yeah, it's bad. exactly. <laughs> and, and and you need something that's going to be set up so it, it's kind of anti-fragile. You know, you don't need to rely on having a DEXA scanner. Now, if I had my own, you know, cranking HIT studio and it was, you know, had three or four trainers under me and it was really busy, you know, I'd probably splash out for some of the cool toys, you know what I mean, or find a way to access them just because it looks good. But, I mean, if you can't lose weight with my fitness pal, a set of scales and a tape measure, well, you ain't ever going to lose weight. You know what I mean? Because you're 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 focusing on something else that's just not relevant. You know, at the end of the day, so stop putting so much food in your mouth. Track the number, put a tape measure around the waist because that's enough. You know, it doesn't matter whether your left leg drops more circumference than your right leg, or or the changes in your arm size, or even your chest. You know, as long as you the weight around the middle is going down at steady intervals when you measure once a month, then you know, that's what you want. Like, and if it, if it hasn't moved in a month, then you've got some fundamental issues. You know, you've got some real shit you need to talk to about that client because if that needle hasn't moved significantly in a month, it means you've either set up the calories wrong, they've underreported, uh, which happens all the time. It's, it's the number one thing. Um, and you need to say to clients that, listen, there's a good chance you're going to stuff this up. You know, if you don't pay attention, if you don't respect this process as much as you should, it's very, very easy to sneak the needle up in a way that will undermine your progress. And because we measure these things, we're going to know, we're going to see it. So I prefer those blunt, simple tools of get on the scale and put a tape measure around the belly because at the end of the day, if someone's got significant fat to lose, then it will be picked up by those things. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not going to need calipers, you know. Calipers is when maybe you're dialing in for a competition, um, and that way you can you can be like, oh yeah, you've you know made these tiny, not so visible gains. Everything's moving in the right direction, and we have a cause or an end goal that's that requires much more depth. But if it's just fat loss and transformation, simple, hey, simple tools, simple plan. And it's more about habit formation, setting up all the little habits, all the little links in the chain so that they come together to produce that result. And I guess a good thing to mention as well is um, what's important is not necessarily how accurate the tool is, as you've talked about there, um, but but also consistency using the same tool. There's nothing worse yeah. than changing tools as you measure because you're going to get you know widely different readings and it's very hard to then track progress meaningfully. Um, so even if you use a scales or you use um, something really low resolution like a, for body fat, like a sculpt or calipers, which might be a sculpt is that you know, electronic device you use, um, which might be out by like 5%, 10%, what have you. As long as you're using the same device, you will see you will see a trend and that's what's important. You know, I've been doing, cause I'm, I'm real nerdy about this. Every Friday morning I do a weigh-in and I do a three point caliper on myself and I track it in a Google sheet and I graph it. And I can see over a year that my lean mass has climbed maybe three or four pounds. Um, and my fat mm-hmm. mass has dropped ever so slightly. And I always stay around kind of between 10 and 8%. And, um, that's for me that's just very motivational because uh, i always want to have that that improving trend and i find that really motivates me to eat well and to train and that's really the purpose of it uh, and obviously see you know that i, I want to see if i'm making making progress um so that's that's important now i just wanted to talk about nutrition for a second um you know this there's obviously this this continuous debate, I suppose you could call it, about the importance of energy balance versus hormones. Um, and, you know, there's a really good quote by Martin Burkan lately, which kind of did its rounds on the internet, which has said something to the effect of calories are important. No, anyone who thinks that calories aren't important are stupid or wrong or something to that effect. Um, but if you think that calories are the be all and end all, then you're even more stupid or something like that. Um, <laughs> 
and I, 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 I want to address this because I, I do agree with you in that um, clearly if you use calories as your metric, um, that's worked for you and it's certainly helped your clients get results and it's helped many, many people get results. Um, but I know that there are some people out there who might go, you know what, I'm not going to advocate calorie counting in my model. Instead, I'm going to do a carnivore diet or I'm going to do low carb or ketogenic because – we kind of, well, it's, maybe it's my opinion or it would seem to be the case that if you eat that way or if you eat like a carnivore diet, for example, or a low-carb diet, often the calories can take care of themselves, right? So you do end up getting an optimal kind of hormonal milieu, which helps you lose fat, but then your, your calories will be in line with that as well, potentially. <laughs> um, so what you could do, again, I don't want to make this kind of the nutritional guidance in this really dogmatic i want to be able to say look if you don't want to do calorie counting instead you want the client to follow you know a specific diet then maybe they could just record the foods and not necessarily or or they could record both maybe the foods and the calories um because i've seen for instance i've worked with people where we haven't done calories at all we actually just did low carb and that individual who uh, is brandon actually whose podcast will come out would have came out sorry about three weeks ago so people can refer to that one. He got a he had a radical transformation in body composition. We never counted calories. Um, he may be an outlier, and he was one of the few who could stick to a low carb type of diet. He, although he did fall off the wagon every now and again, as we all do. Um, but just wanted to say that you know, like you you had it in the the plan to me. You know, pick your nutritional philosophy, um, which kind of indicates that you're saying to people, look, find the approach that works for you and gets your clients results. Now. Is that fair? What I just said. Do you disagree with that? Do you think no, no, no? Just keep it simple. Focus on calories. Like, how do you think? It's, about sort, of, it's sort of complicated because I think I think when you talk about these processes, is is people kind of when they want to shoot down something or compare against something, pros and cons, is they kind of con- construct the straw man of what they think it is and destroy the straw man without kind of considering the fact that like. I'm not advocating that you hit your calorie target of 1,800 calories per day with, you know, butter. You know what I mean? I don't want you to get out, you know, 2,000 calories worth of butter and just spoon it into your mouth. Yeah, didn't you say to me once that you had some high-powered executive client who would like, yeah, yeah, I hit my calories today, but I did half my calories with champagne or something or Prosecco. They they, they, (laughs) they did, yeah, something like nine glasses of Prosecco and they (laughs) skipped a meal. So they could, yeah, yeah. (laughs) True story. Um, And he he did end up getting good results, which is funny enough, but... um, Obviously, like alcohol is like I don't advocate any alcohol. I, I don't advocate drinking any calories, you know. So there, there is nuances to food and food quality that matter. But one of the things that I think is really important is like you need you need a way to establish habits. And it's not so like the the calorie target works perfectly well. You know, every single competition bodybuilder in the history of ever has tracked their calories and their macros going into that competition. So it works. But on top of that, they've also eaten, you know, chicken, rice and broccoli or, you know, whatever it is. And a lot of champion bodybuilders have also done keto diets, but they've always tracked that number. So there's no doubt that energy in, energy out is what's happening. But the complexity of hormone signaling underlying all of those things is is much more complicated than just saying saying calories are king. And difficult to track as well, right? Yeah, it's much much more yeah. And so what I'm essentially doing is is I'm explaining them roughly, you know, how to eat and what a meal should be like. And I'll I'd even say to people like you know, if you want to go carnivore diet, you know, very, very simple to track. You know, it's very easy to weigh the ribeye, you know, like, like you know, or, or weigh the amount of butter you slap on top of the ribeye, you know, and, and salt. That's about all there is to a carnivore diet or the, the one egg you treat yourself with. Um, <laughs> and, and, and it'll work, you know what I mean? But here's a good example of, of why I like to see calories is because what can happen is, okay, say you say to someone, oh, let's do the carnivore diet. And I think for a lot of people, elimination diets work really well because, you know, high protein, high fat, low carbs, it does set your body up to control hunger signals much better. 
your your body, especially if you're sort of from a European or Northern European background, is is much better suited to those kind of you know caveman style diets. You just you just run on it better. Your energy runs better when your brain's running on fats and ketones. Blah 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 blah. Like I, I agree with all the arguments in a sense, but the problem is like you're not training someone who's a diehard carnivore person. You're training a normal person who's with a family with time constraints and they may love the idea of dropping into something puritanical but they might not you know what i mean so you have to have the tools to navigate it and the other thing is like go to any carnival form on the internet and there'll be just a litany of people that are like oh i've been doing this for six weeks and i've actually gained a kilo like you, you that question comes on on these carnival forums every single day and then some psychopath will come in with, oh, your body's healing. Sometimes it takes one to two years to, for your body to like heal itself and then you'll start to get in better shape. Like you hear the strangest like cuckoo things on some of these like more puritanical forums. And at the end of the day, like whatever, whatever style of eating you pick in terms of, you know, food quality and stuff like that and food sources, if you at least track the, the calorie amounts and even the macros a little bit, which my fitness pal will do for you, you've got a record of what happened. You know, you can you can testify as long as that they're they've reported properly um what they've been doing. And you could see in there, for example, that, you know, do you really need to get fifteen hundred calories from Cadbury chocolate mini eggs and then, you know, eat three quarters of a chicken breast to make your eighteen hundred for the day? Like is <laughs> Is, do you do you think that's the be, the way we're going to get this done? You know what I mean. So, the calories is almost like a vehicle for them to just report what they're doing, and it captures the amount of energy going in. It captures the macros. It captures the food source. It captures the food quality. It gives you everything you can possibly see, all of that information in one fell swoop, and it gets them to practice a daily habit of thinking about what they're doing, thinking about the food that's going in their mouth. And you as the coach have the ability to navigate what you see. So, you know, when you build your business model, you you might want to do, you know, an elimination diet where you go, you know, you're going to eat no carbs, low carbs, you know, carnivore only. And like, I don't have anything against that. And even in my support literature, which which I've sent today, you can see that I've mentioned the fact that, you know, lower carbs is probably a good idea to regulate um, your your hunger signals, you know, which is true. Um, but it's not, it's not the be all and end all. Um, and you got to start people where they're at. And, you know, for myself personally, like, when I'm dieting hardcore, like it's not about, you know, the food type or the food sources. It's about being accountable. And I I personally need to do my fitness pal every day for 60 days in a row, hit my target or underneath my target for me to transform my body. And I'm into this. I love this. You know, I love fitness and exercise and things like that. So the, the normal person that comes through your door is going to need probably the same level of oversight. You know, they're going to need to have it on their mind all the time because it's so easy to overconsume calories. It's so easy to do. And if you do it too many times, the plan's not going to happen. So it's important to keep in mind that my, my calorie counting is not a be all and end all statement. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying to people, you know, eat three McFlurries and one chicken salad a night or anything like that. I'm, I'm telling them to just pay attention and report and provide testimony of what you're doing frequently so that me as the coach has insights about what you've been doing because I can see then everything that's transpired. You know, and I can spot things for like, why are you having nine Proseccos and no dinner? That's not what we want to do because that's going to make you sick and you're not going to get good results in the gym. Um, and there's no building blocks for muscle in nine Proseccos. You know I mean? I mean, there's got to so, be at least a five grams of protein in there, right? <laughs> something like that. But uh, you say, so the, the, the big point is, you know, it's, it's nuanced, you know, as much as I might say calories are king, it's I just need you to follow this process because by following this one process, I actually capture everything I need to capture. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, and I can optimize. 
I totally agree. And um, I think that was really well put. Your yeah, that I, I actually understand it much better now as to why you why you do that. Um, no, that was really helpful. This has been so useful. Um, I just think that oh, hopefully. Well, I have certainly found it very useful and hopefully the listeners have found it a, a very nice kind of thing for them to uh, to consume and or to help them get started in this if they're seriously considering starting some kind of high-intensity training online coaching uh, business. Do you have any, I mean, we've mentioned a few resources already, but are there any books or resources that come to mind that the listeners might find useful in getting more skilled at becoming an online coach? Is there anything that comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, that, that Tim Drummond book, yeah. um, We'll find the exact name for it, but um, it's awesome. Tim Drummond's a really, really great guy. So he he does um, he does sell quite high price packages, teaching people how to start online businesses, but they're not specifically sort of high intensity yeah. training or anything like that. But um, I've always talked to him and got a bit of mentorship from him over the years, and um, yeah, his book's really, really good. And I have done the um, oh, that online personal training certificate. I think it's online training academy or something like that by John Goodman and it's you know it costs a couple of hundred bucks it's really like wonderfully comprehensive you get a certificate at the end of it you, you've got a great resource of a book that that covers all the ins and outs of it but one of the problems with something that's a course or a big broad resource is that you lose decidability so you get shown all the features the full territory of what you can and couldn't do and then when it comes to designing something, you kind of get that sort of, you know, paradox of choice in that, oh, man, that was like almost too much information. I don't even know what to do. And so it wasn't until like I got Tim Drummond's book. He sent it to me for free. I just responded to a, an online thing on Facebook where he was doing a giveaway. And it just it just said minimalism to me. It just said just drop it down to those basic small essential steps, those small critical data points. Um, and and then he'll, he'll even say to people, you know, the number one thing is just getting them to under consume instead of over consume calories and prevent them from misreporting. Like that's almost, that's almost all a transformation is in a nutshell. Like that's just it's just that one thing. So you can add all these things. You can get them to do the bod pod. You can do caliper readings. You know, you can add all sorts of crazy resources to their life. But if they don't sit down and construct the meal and measure it properly and enter it into my fitness pal properly, there's no way to coach them. There's no way to see anything. Nothing, nothing in terms of the data can be relied on. You cannot be a coach under those conditions. So you have to kind of boil it down to those one or two essential steps that matter and and get them home and and even it might sound weird you know as a as an online hit coach that for the most part I want to solve people's fat problems actually you know that's probably the best thing you can do for them is make them look a bit better by dropping some body fat off the middle you know and then keep them strength training for the most part even if they don't perfectly achieve failure as long as they follow a rough rough plan and get the weights up over time and don't hurt themselves, they'll slap on some muscle. You know, it might not be technically the, the most highest amount they could have achieved in that time. But if your business model is, is stopping someone being a fatso, then, you know, pull the big levers that control that, which is diet. You know what I mean? It's, it's the training will kind of take care of itself. And sometimes the training's more about their genetic potential than anything else. You know, I've had some of the most diligent online clients that put on muscle really, really slowly, despite the fact that they pay attention, send me form videos, they listen to all my advice. And then I've got someone like some of the in-person clients, you know, the one I told you about the other day that, that wanted to go from three to four sessions. And I was kind of like, it's not really worth it. But that person will like slap on muscle mass like you wouldn't believe when they're like just coming in and rocking out, you know what I mean? Like, you know, not worrying about the numbers. So it's just, it's, I think the one thing, the best thing you can do for someone is to take them out of those risk factors of being obese, you know, take, take them, take them, their, their waist down to a, a nice healthy flat measurement. So they look good in a polo shirt, a polo shirt on the golf course. Like, and that might sound weird if you if if you're selling a, a HIT business, but you're, you're not selling online hit coaching to to people who want to, you know, become the most purest Mike Mensa fan they can possibly be. You're like helping a normal person or perhaps an executive, you know, lose some body fat. 
and muscle up a bit, you know. So pull the correct lever, well, you know, there, and there, just... There are some niches of people that are, you know, Mike Mensah disciples and Arthur Jones disciples who do, you know, and that's probably like Drew Bay, for instance, has, has probably got quite a good um, uh, business where he's helping those types of clients who are actually really, you know, puritanical, to use your word, uh, about high intensity training. But that is a very niche market. And I guess I just wanted to also say something we haven't really talked about very much is how important it is to find your niche. I mean, you've, you know, developed expertise working with CEOs and, and high powered execs. And we've talked about that on a previous podcast. Um, but maybe it's also about someone finding their niche and then and then tailoring this to them. Because like you say, if they are, you know, a stay-at-home mom who wants to shed some pounds and you come at them with a consolidated routine by Mike Mensah, uh, they might not be, uh, they might not buy into that. Uh, who knows? So uh, yeah, it's just important to tailor your, tailor your service to your target market. Yeah. Absolutely. But like I said, you know, with fat loss, you know, it's it's a system that could take any person who walked in the door from from being overweight to to being in good shape. You know, by dropping body fat. So, a big part of it's going to be that calorie tracking or keeping on top of whatever food elimination diet, be it carnivore or keto or low carb, whatever whatever that approach is. You still need a way to keep on top of that. You know. Know what I mean? So even if I was like, yeah, let's do carnival with someone, I'd be like, I still don't want them to wing it. I still want them to tell me the quantities. And carnival is probably the easiest one to get your quantities right. You know, that's that's the great thing about a lot of elimination diets is 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 just there's not so much density or, or complexity about measuring the ingredients. You know, when you eat processed foods, it's just a little bit all over the shop, you know. Um, but measuring your rib eyes is pretty bloody simple. So, you know, if, if your approach is carnivore, you know, like get in those carnivore forums and track those people down and show them how they can add high intensity training, which this is a good thing. Like when you, every, every online hit coach is going to need to combine training and nutrition. If, if they don't, I don't think they have a business model. I, I think online training is, is more about the food side of things than it is about the training. But the training side of it allows us to um, kind of riff on the ideas if we have the efficient solution, a time-saving solution where a person doesn't need to be in the gym all the time. So that's always a great pitch. And when you know your material, you can demonstrate expertise by talking about high-intensity training with a person who isn't that familiar with it. But in terms of the diet stuff, I mean, it's, 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 it's not so much the knowledge, but it's the accountability. You know, it's like being on top of a process that works and making sure they they achieve that process so that's really really critical but a, a good aside for people to think about is is like you know all the best bands kind of or all the big breakout bands usually slam two genres together um you know so let's look at like some like i used to like new metal when i was a kid growing up so you had like limp biscuit and corn and, and all those bands they, they would basically mash you know the the world of metal with like the groove based sort of hip hop culture of the time. And because they mashed those two tribes together, they captured both markets and they kind of existed between markets. And one of the things you can think about with your business model is, okay, well, how do I make the rap rock of, you know, training? And so you've got diet and you've got diet and training on training and nutrition, and you can have this puritanical HIT and you can smash it up against something puritanical, um, like the carnivore diet, you know what I mean? So, or, or you could, you, you see a lot of online coaches that'll be about, you know, they're vegans and they're into strength training and they'll smash the two worlds together knowing full well that someone who buys into veganism will buy into whatever the other kind of niche is and vice versa. So it's actually a very good tactic in some ways. Like my, my calorie tracking approach is almost a little bit vanilla, but my, my whole system of thought is, regular habits, regular oversight, full accountability of the data. That's what my process is overall. It's about seeing critical data, acting on it and optimizing and building trends so that we run you like an experiment, you know, that we can alter. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be a carnivore guy with HIT, you know, realize that that's a very smart strategy. You know, you can really like sex up that marketing pitch, you know, with, with certain types of people that, you know, are, are very dogmatic about things. So I think tons of carnival people would absolutely buy into HIT and vice oh, yeah. versa. I've already seen that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've seen yeah. that like with my people that listen to my podcast who come across it from a because they they listen to an episode where I talk about talk to Ted Naiman or Scott Mycinski about carnivore diets, and then they they get into the whole world of hit, and they're like, yes, like the hit is the carnivore diet of the training world, you know, because they see the carnivore is like the quite often the magic bullet or the most effective dietary approach and then it is obviously being the most efe- efficient training approach so it kind of melds quite nicely but just to wrap up what you were saying there um it's quite interesting how your portfolio of services that make up your online coaching service form your marketing right because you're defining yourself as a category and that's going to appeal to a niche group of people and um, so that's kind of cool because you know it's interesting to think, oh, some people might think, oh, after this podcast, there's going to be loads of people starting online high-intensity training coaching businesses, but there's so much room for this. So much room. Mm. Uh, I mean, you can diversify, as we've talked about, in terms of the your approach and your, you know, in, in terms of the type of diet you advocate and training and accountability and additional ancillary services. But then also, there's so much room for this because pretty much everyone needs this service. Um, so the market demand is is very high. And one thing I will say is, um, you know, I think, I think obviously you can't outwork a bad diet. And um, we all know that, that the diet has to be on point for you to lose fat. But I do think the training is really important because, you know, I'm just thinking about myokines, which is something that, uh, you know, has been written about a fair bit recently. And, you know, I was at, Rec 2019 recently, and Doug did a presentation where he talked about myokines. And what is quite clear is just how much strength training um, makes fat loss far more permissive because of the myokine effect. So things like interleukin, I think it's interleukin six, and all these different myokines, and how they improve things like insulin sensitivity, and just seem to optimize the hormonal environment for fat loss. Which is why I just love this whole idea of trying to get more people doing hit and having a good diet because the results are profound when you combine the two. Um, so I'm hopeful that people can take this information and roll with it. Um, and also, I just want to take this opportunity to say, you know, Gary is an expert in um, building these kinds of businesses. He's done it for himself and now he's in the business of helping others create online high-intensity training coaching businesses. So if you're looking for a mentor or someone to help you, um, definitely talk to Gary um, and we'll put links in the show notes to your different resources. So with that in mind, Gary, what's the best way for the listeners to contact you and find out more about you at this time? Yeah, just that email, Intense Gains, Gary. Um, that's the best way to contact me. Okay. At the moment, I'm still still off Facebook. Um, Instagram's there, Intense Gains. Um, and you can find me. And, and truth be told, almost almost everyone who follows follows you knows how to find me. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's pretty cool. So we, we all all tend to know each other, which is which is pretty handy. But yeah, intense gains Gary at gmail dot com. Just shoot me an email, say good day. We get on a Skype call, have a chat, get to know you. That's the best way to do things. Sounds good. Um, any parting thoughts? I mean, you've said a lot. I don't know if you've got anything more to say. Any kind of parting thoughts on how those can get started with an online? hit coaching business? Yeah, I mean, I would just start by thinking about, you know, what is your process? Too, too many people that, that are into training, you know, just as a hobby or a passion, they kind of stumble into it and they never kind of crystallize or formalize what they do or what they could do for someone into, you know, a list of weekly or week of daily, weekly and monthly activities that form up a process. So, the reason we started off this podcast talking about, you know, the, that support document is, is it's really critical to get crystal clear about what this process is because you have to sell it to someone and then you have to guide them through it and it needs to work. You know, you might need to test it on some friends for free to see, you know, what, what the challenges are, what the pitfalls are, you know, and, and you don't know what you don't know, you know what I mean? So, this current document that we'll give away that I've sent to you today is is kind of, you know, probably revision four or five for me in terms of a process. And and I think I'll still riff and still experiment with things based on, you know, what happens with clients and stuff like that. But um it's um getting it down on paper is is the best way getting it down on paper or typing it up is the best way to really organize your thoughts. And in some ways, you could read this support document and you can almost see my entire pitch. I'm actually almost re-articulating 
the pitch for why high intensity training and why, you know, accounting for food and data metrics is essential for this process of online coaching. You know what I mean? So just anyone out there who's interested in it, you know, make sure you build it out first, know exactly what it looks like, know where, know what information you want to track, where you're going to put it, how you're going to organize it, how you're going to communicate what you need people to do to them and put it all together and test it on some people. You know what I mean? Try it out on some people, get some feedback from them. You know what I mean? So like one of my former clients today, I asked for a bit of feedback about, about the, the sort of version one product I did with him, you know, years ago. And he said, oh, yeah, I'd like to be talked to every day. You know, I'd like to be able to contact you on Messenger every day. And I don't know, I don't really like that because it's just, it's like way too needy almost. But, you know, if you, if, if you put the right price behind it, you know, and this the thing is this guy's a good friend of mine. So we, we chat shit every day anyway. But <laughs> You know what I mean? So it's like. Maybe, maybe, you know, you, you find out some funny things from people where, you know, some people might say, oh, I just, I don't want to do that every day or I don't want to report calories every day. What's an easier way? And then maybe you could insert, well, we're going to have to do something like an elimination diet, intermittent fasting, carnivore, meat only, no drinking. That's the only way I think I can get this to work um, without counting calories. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I just make a, another point here is to say, you know, if you, if you do, so that, so it's interesting you mentioned that that person said they wanted a daily, daily chat. Uh, if that's something you are interested in creating in your business and you price it accordingly, which I think is really important. Um, I do actually do that in my own business. So I have, uh, in the community I provide, I have a private coaching thread that members have and I'm active there usually daily. Uh, and so members right there, you know, things they need help with, um, things they need support on or questions they have. And I usually respond daily. Uh, and it's very, it's quite easy to manage because it's just a forum thread and, you know, I give short actionable advice. Uh, and again, uh, I can, if people need help with, if they're interested in building that separately off, you know, off Facebook and their own community and building that private coaching aspect into it, uh, I can help you with that or, or, or Gary can, I'm sure as well. Um, so just to highlight as well, uh, for, so all the links, all the resources you mentioned today, um, the resources that Gary's providing, which are just gold. And I'm Gary, I'm really grateful for you providing that because that stuff's really going to help people get started. So that's like an example of his uh, program that he sends clients in the beginning. And then also the, uh, the tracker on Google, which, yeah, I mean, talk, talk about someone who's done all of the heavy lifting for you. And then you just have to basically take that and make it your own. I wouldn't advise you copy it because it might not come off as well unless it's got to definitely be in line with your, your personality and your approach. Um, but if you're interested in getting all those resources, uh, please go to the blog post, which is at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash online hit. And for all episodes, please go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash podcast. And until next time, thank you very very much for listening. Discover how to become a great personal trainer and build a successful high intensity training business. Check out highintensitybusiness.com. highintensitybusiness.com.